Hi, this is Lucy Larson, Manager of Museum Experience and Interpretation at the San Jose Museum of Art. SJMA is proud to present the series Artist of the Week, featuring artists from our permanent collection. The interviews you hear were conducted in December 2006 and January 2007. We hope you enjoy this series and subscribe to SJMA's podcast. For the Ruth Asawa podcast, we had the pleasure of interviewing her eldest daughter, Aiko Kunio, who shared with us her experience of growing up with such a prolific and creative artist. We also interviewed Danielle Cornell, Curator of American Art at the DeYoung Museum in San Francisco. Danielle is the curator of the exhibition and author of the accompanying catalog, The Sculpture of Ruth Asawa, Contours in the Air. My name is Danielle Cornell, and I'm a director of contemporary art projects and curator of American art at the DeYoung Museum in San Francisco. I first met Ruth uh, over five years ago as we began to prepare to build the new building, and out of that relationship grew the installation in the tower, the uh, exhibition of uh, Ruth Asawa, the retrospective exhibition, Contours in the Air. I think that Ruth's sculpture is unique in several ways, most principally in the fact that she was not bound by traditional conventions of sculpture. She was interested in reinventing the very notion of what sculpture is. And consistent with a lot of modernist artists, she wanted to take a look at the way that we understood a particular artistic practice and create a new vocabulary. And she did that by taking sculpture off of the pedestal, bringing it up into the air, putting it on the wall. She began to think about how sculpture in combination might work to activate and animate a space in relationship to the viewer. She began to think about all of the ways in which spectators entered into a space that was more of an installation space, an environment. Um, not thinking about sculpture as an object, but thinking about it as a way to create an entire emotional experience, a mood. My name is Aiko Lanier Cunio, and I'm Ruth Asawa's daughter. She learned the looping technique. It's been called crocheted or knit or woven, but it really is a looping technique. And she learned that in Mexico while she was a student. And she went to Mexico to teach art to a village children in Toluca. And they, in turn, taught her how to make these looped wire baskets they used to hold eggs. So she took that idea back to Black Mountain College and then started turning them into these more uh, closed forms that then started to interlock. And they, they ceased to be baskets anymore, and they took on these sort of um, negative in-and-out forms based on figure ground studies that she did in, at Black Mountain College. In 1961, some friends of hers went to Death Valley and brought back a tumbleweed. They handed it to Ruth and said, here's something for you to draw. They knew about her love of line. So she tried to draw it several times and was always dissatisfied with the result. And so she decided that if she were actually fashion this tumbleweed in wire as a sculptural form, that she'd be able to understand its structure. And once she understood its structure, then that would allow her to draw it. She took this, this tumbleweed and realized that it was basically a series of branching forms. And from that, she developed this principle of division. She bundles wires together and then begins branching or dividing them. So it's a very simple binary operation. But it results in these forms which start very densely and then uh, divide to the point that they become very diffuse at the ends. And from that process, all of the rest of her tied wire sculptures evolved. In the sculpture that you have on display here in San Jose, you can see that she's actually taken two of these forms, which she's doubled and then divided and then woven together. And so she's created this very elegant, simple form, which has this geometric density in the middle and then moves out in ways that really open it up 
until you get to the edges where um, it again results in a series of starburst branches which are quite exquisitely beautiful. What was life like growing up in your home with such a prolific and talented artist? Well, it was probably organized chaos, but it was definitely, it was a lot of fun. There were six children. My mother always worked in the house. Her shop or studio was never outside the house. It was always there, so we always saw her working, and then she'd stop and cook dinner and do things with the children or whatever. So we were always there when she worked and when she took care of us, and it all sort of blended together. It wasn't like there was a division between her work and her raising a family. She sort of made it all work together. She didn't always sit down with us and teach us art projects. We sort of learned when we asked a question about something or she had an idea of something, you know, that she thought we might be interested in. But really it was it was just sort of, it was all just there. And, and having grown up in a house, I thought everyone's mother did the, the same things. You know, that's sort of what it's like. The mother that you have is is what you think everyone has. She also is important in the Bay Area in the sense that her interest in the arts as the foundation for a progressive society is central to all of the work that she does. She was attracted to Black Mountain College because it was founded in 1933 by John Rice on the principles of John Dewey, who as a progressive educator believed that you couldn't separate out the various disciplines in education, that they all were integrally related, and that ultimately the creative arts were the foundation for all of the rest of education. That notion that all of the arts are not only related, but arts and sciences are related, and that the foundation of a society that is inventive and progressive and growing is rooted in the arts fits very well with the aesthetic of the Bay Area, which is one of the most progressive areas in the country politically. And for her, it makes sense. And so that's why she became such a strong advocate in the 70s and 80s for the School of the Arts in San Francisco. She probably is the most important person in terms of the founding of that school. It was through her efforts that the need for that school and, and the push for that school really went forward. 